God with us, revealed in us, His name is called Emmanuel. And when that again to our program this afternoon we've got one more hymn to sing 33 in the new 33 in the new <laughs> and this is the old hymn 33 oh is it it's a in the old yes and the penis have gone wild i know oh and my just a crazy
So just an announcement uh, as we, for people online and people at camp, tomorrow is a free day. Um, so you'll be able to do whatever you need to do tomorrow. Um, if you need to do washing, ask Paul and he'll tell you where the nearest laundromat is. Up at Lowood, nine kilometres away. So you go back down to the main road, turn right, go along past the school, the showgrounds of the school, and the big sign says Lowood. Go up to Lowood and they've got a big industrial washing machines up there. So if you want two family loads, you can put them in and then it does the same in the dryer. So then you can stay there, sort it out and bring it home. Probably quite easy up there. Um, so that's the local one. That's the closest, 9K. Uh, for all, those who don't know what to do, Toowoomba is up the, is in 45 minutes, one hour up the road. Very nice, small country town. Lots of um, walks through there, a really nice lookout. Or there's lots of um, walks around where, where the dam is around here. Or you can just sit around and relax. Wyvernhoe. Wyvernhoe Dam. The pool's open for the kids. Pool's open <laughs> for those brave and young. Um, we will not be televising again till seven o'clock tomorrow night after tonight. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yep, because the, tomorrow there's there's no organised prayer. Oh, okay, nothing organised. Well, no. just says However, if you at eight o'clock, there's going to be some people here, and we're just going to pray before okay. everybody heads off. Everybody's welcome here. But as far as somebody leading out at eight thirty, that won't happen. Eight o'clock for all those who want to have a, a, a prayer, um, and then. The day is yours. Okay, shall we hand it over to Pastor Adrian? No, Pastor Adrian needs it. We can do B for blank. <laughs> Wonderful to have Colin and Lynn join us. Amen. Consider yourself sorely missed. And the bunny and Luke. And Lavanya and Luca. Luca is right here. Luca's there. There's Luca. Our mum's down the. Yes, wonderful. Glad that you can join us. And very illuminating this afternoon. Yeah, how did? What do you think of this afternoon? Awesome. Well done. Thank you. Yeah. For sharing that insightful truth. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Well, uh, Jenny Timms put me on to both of those gentlemen and. I've, I've, I've known Cyril for a little while, Chris. So it's just something very interesting to think about, isn't it? Yeah. In regard to the effects of electricity. Yeah. And just, it was interesting just doing some assessments on the house and there's certainly some challenges here, but the difference between how it affects Paul and how it affects Di is quite, it affects people differently, doesn't it? No effect on you. Just, just your heart. It's just Paul, you're harder to cook. That's all. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yes, um, I had a presentation that. I thought about doing in terms of uh, finding harmony in scripture. I, we did this down at, uh, we actually did this at Toronto uh, when, when you were there. Or I was open to uh, if other people wanted to have questions or things that, did this just go up? No, it didn't. No, I'm, just, cool. I'm just talking like this. <laughs> uh, or, or questions that people might have, I could do that as well. I'm quite open to. Uh, or we can do the PowerPoint. What do you want to do? Danielle? I've got a question. Got a question? Yeah, new wine in new wineskins. Sorry? New wine in new wineskins. Yes, new wine in new wineskins. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 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 Paul? A question was raised at the uh, Lean Farm for the Ipswich Men's Group. We've got about 20 blokes at Ipswich that are studying sanctuary.
Page Tracks and Prophets, page 68, tells you Adam killed the first lamb. Uh, oh, the books are here. Uh, Danielle, new, new wine, in, this is the new wineskin. It's framework. Wineskin is a framework, how you operate, how you <coughs> do things. And it's, you can't put the father and son in the old wineskin. It doesn't, it doesn't. I thought it had an affiliation with Well, that, that, that could fit as well. And you can't put the character in the old wineskin. You can't put the character of God in the old wineskin. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. Yeah, Ex exactly. Well, could it be also the wineskin is us, unconverted, because we don't want to see it? An, an old wineskin? Yeah. Yep. And, the, and the wine is, is doctrine and beliefs. That's it. Yes, this has certainly felt like old wineskin some days. So, uh, yeah, wrong beliefs, wrong belief systems that are affecting you. All right, well, I, before, before we continue, I better say a prayer and we'll... Uh... Father, we give you thanks that we can come before you. We just pray that you would guide us as we spend some time together. We pray that you would lead us and guide us and this will be a profitable time for all of us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A lot of people have questions about the calendar. And how does the calendar work? Fiona. I just wanted to make a comment that I would really like Lester's presentation today written down in something because it resonated with, with me as a person who I have to do something. There it should be a tick list and I can see there's an equation. There's just a, a thing that you have to believe on. Yeah. There's not a thing to do. There, there we go. You'll, you'll find that in there too. So, yeah. So, uh, but it was very succinct for Succinct, me. there you go. And, and an equation. That okay, I got an equation. I like okay. equations. That, that's good. So, there you go, Lester. We should work on that together. <laughs> <laughs> got something to do now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Do you believe that? <laughs> <laughs> so, no, questions, any, any people have questions on the calendar and how things work and operate? Tony, Tony. Um, so the, I was talking to a guy in, in his church in Mullen, he be about probably two weeks ago. He's pretty, pretty little, the learned guy, he's been in the church. Hang on Tony, uh, can we just have everyone, just, I can't quite hear. Okay, he, he, yep. he's a pretty learned guy. He's been in Adventist for 40 years. And when I started telling him about 1840, uh, we were talking about when, how Adventists got the, um, how they got 1844, right? Or, sorry, the Day of Atonement. He said no, that's not, he saw, he's seen no proof of that. What, do you remember what he said about it? But he had this really good one that really was like a real curly one and I couldn't really answer it. Um, and I was just wondering if you could go over that again because what he was saying was that they never got it from uh, the calendar. They never got it from a Day of Atonement. And and as you as we've learned here and been taught here, or if you like, or the, the understanding that I have, that, that, that's exactly where it came from. Mm. Yeah. And they got it from... Uh, so if you could just all right no worries yeah. just take you to the website and uh, yeah we'll uh, it all comes back to uh, I'll come down to uh, <coughs> down to <coughs> this little booklet here the true midnight cry. Yeah. Okay. What did uh, if we open up this booklet? Who, who was the, the man who gave the true midnight cry? Samuel Snow. Samuel Snow. What is in this document? Well, I've I've listed that, listed here on the side. This is what's written in the true midnight cry. 
And and well, let's let's step back a little bit further. Why is what Samuel Snow did so significant to us? Because the light from the midnight fire will shine all the way to the heavenly city. Thank you, Reuben. So the very first thing that Ellen White was told by the angel after the disappointment in 1844, early writings, page 14, in the very first paragraph, says that the light which lights the path all the way to the city is the midnight cry. Now when Ellen White hears this term, midnight cry, what does she understand that to be? No. All, all the things that they had just passed through in the true midnight cry. They, all the pioneers understood that the message that came in July from July 21, 1844, was the true midnight cry. This is what they all understood. So when she heard that, Reuben? Samuel Snow pointed that out in his sermon. Yeah. So he point, He ran them through it. He went, took them through it. And... So this is what we're building on. So when, and, and well, let's just read the statement. We'll come to early writings. Early writings. Just so we understand where this is, this is coming from. So, um, here. At this I raised my eyes, she's gone into vision, and saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. Midnight cry. And this is... And this light shone... This light shone... All along the path... So what is written in the Midnight Cry document is what's going to guide you all the way to the heavenly city. So what is in the Midnight Cry that was given by... Can, can I just ask a question, before we go any further? What is, so where did they get the word Midnight Cry from? Okay. Did it come from, did it come, yeah, no, it came from the Bible, but did it come from the, the, the ten virgins? You know, like, yeah. Parable of yeah. the ten virgins. So what does that kind of do with, how do you line those two up? How do you line those two up? Because... The virgins are waiting. They're waiting, and a cry is made at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. In April of 1844, because William Miller had said originally that Jesus would come from approximately the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. When the spring of 1844 came and went, then there was a tarrying time because they were like, oh, what's going on? And there was a lot of confusion and there was a lot of difficulty. And what do we do now? And then Samuel Snow came because... Um, uh, no, the, Joshua Himes had been doing a lot of study on the, on the calendar and the Karaites and a whole lot of other stuff. He'd been publishing stuff through 1843 and Samuel Snow picked all of this material up and in July of 1844 he gave the time for when the bridegroom would come as they understood it which was the 10th day of the 7th Jewish months which is October 22nd 1844 and when, you, and when Samuel Snow gave that date there was a tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the pioneers understood to be the midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Okay? So he was the voice of the midnight cry. I just remembered what that guy said. He said that never happened until after 1844. That the calendar wasn't given until after. The date and the time. That's what his belief was. That, that's what he said. So you, you're saying before? He was oh, saying okay. it was after. What, all I'm saying is that uh, for those of us who walk in the footsteps of our pioneers and, yeah. and the spirit of prophecy, it's very clear what it is. Okay. If people don't accept those things, well, yeah. it could be anything. Well, so so for, for when we look at the midnight cry, these are the things that light the path all the way to the city.
Okay. I, I've got the summary of them here. I encourage you to download the book, The True Midnight Cry. Mm -hmm. The 6,000 years. Okay. So that's, that's one thing. The, the, we've been living approximately for 6,000 years. Approximately. <coughs> 2520 is part of the midnight cry. Why is the 2520 important? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons why it's important. <laughs> Thank you. It links us to Israel. It renders useless the disp dispensational system of the covenants. Because there was a scattering of God's people uh, at uh, um, the time when Israel was taken captive, captive into Babylon, 677 BC. There was a scattering that took place. And then there is a gathering at the time of 1844. And Ellen White talks about this in early writings when she's talking about the daily as well. She talks about the daily and she talks about 2520, but that's, a, that's another whole subject. So the, the 2,520 year prophecy links the remnant to Israel. Eddie? It's also a second witness to two, 2,300 days. 2,300 days. Now, there is a statement in Great Controversy that seems to indicate that the 2,300 days is the longest time period. But when you look at it more closely, you will see that that's not correct. Because all of the Adventist pioneers, all of the Millerite pioneers, were preaching the 2520. And it was their lead argument, in a lot of cases, for 1844. Debbie. Between the March date that they've set and the 22nd. Of the uh, bless you, bless you. So, if on the day uh, that, on the basis that a day equals a year, and the night starts before the day, that means a day for a year that the night part would be six months and the day part would be six months. So, when they get three months into the night part, what does that take you up to on a day scale? It takes you up to midnight. So July 21, 1844 was the prophetic midnight of that year. And James White talks about this in his autobiography. And, uh, and a few of the pioneers mention this. And this is, this is important history that we must hang on to. It mentions the 20... Sorry? This is history that this man didn't know. Well, I'm not alone. No, no, the, you know, you, no, the, the man who was speaking to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, this man. <laughs> See, when, when I went to the United States, let's not derail too far. When I went to the United States and I got in, introduced to some messianic aspects of the feasts and I started to see the plethora of ideas that were out there and I was listening carefully and I was listening to to how these people were relating to the spirit of prophecy and many of them were becoming just moving into Judaism and there was a loss of Adventist identity taking place for a lot of these people and why am I not willing to lose an Adventist identity because of 1844, because of the Adventist pioneers, because this is a special message that came to the earth. It is, you know, early writings, page 258, the Lord laid a solid, immovable platform. The destiny of souls depends upon the manner in which it is received. Great controversy. The, the outpouring of the Spirit between 1840 and 1844 was one of the most powerful movements in human history, spiritually speaking, uh, outside of Pentecost at the time of Jesus Christ. So if you're going to build a platform outside of that, you're outside. You're, just, you're not on the foundation. And so I'm looking for the pieces to put together. How do I build a feast calendar... And connect it harmoniously with what I know to be the truth in terms of 1844 and all of those things. And I, I'm listening to different people and some of them were starting to say, oh, Jesus might have died in AD 32. And other different things. And we don't need the year day principle anymore. And just all this sliding off the platform that was beginning to occur. It was really troubling me. The, um, 
Adventist that was just sliding off and losing that peculiar identity and saying that Uriah Smith got it wrong and this, and then they start reinterpreting prophecy and then the daily gets chucked off into the future and it just it butchers the whole thing. And I'm like, no thanks. I'm <laughs> I know, I, I know for myself that, that the Lord led the Adventist pioneers. Mm. And for anyone that doesn't stand at that, at that point, say, so, okay, fair enough. If you have a different opinion, that's fine. This is where I stand. This is, this is my understanding of, of things. Mm. Debbie? The only other way people can go when they want to keep the peace and they believe most of what we do and they want to chuck out on white, they go to the Messianic. Yeah, go, go to the Messianic yeah. perspective. And, and all those types of things. See, the, <laughs> the 70 weeks of Daniel 9, okay, is, is a part of the midnight cry. And what are the 70 weeks of Daniel 9? 457 BC up to AD 34 with the baptism of Christ in 27 AD, the death of Christ in AD 31, the gospel going to the Gentiles in AD 34, this is all laid out in the midnight cry. It's critical. Now, this is the, the next point. The year of the crucifixion being AD 31. Now, this is very important to understand. The only way, and I, I did a presentation on this some time ago, the only way you can get a crucifixion occurring in AD 31 is if you follow the Karaite Jewish calendar. You don't get AD 31 from following the vernal equinox. Or any other system that you get. You only get it from the Karaite Jewish calendar. So if you reject the Karaite system, you reject AD 31, which means you reject the 490, which means you reject all the dates that Adventism has been given. So in rejecting that calendar, you throw the whole Adventist prophetic framework out the door, which many are willing to do. Yeah. I'm not. So... And on this basis, in the midnight cry, this would simplify so many things for God's people. It says, Friday is the day that Christ died, in that year of AD 31. End of story. It's, there's so much discussion about this. Wednesday crucifixion. No, Friday crucifixion. Connected with AD 31. And you're just locking all these pieces in. Locking all these pieces So, yes. Yeah. So there's. Of Rachel, they, hmm? He was he was taken down by should have been taken down to the Sabbath. The others were. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. 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 That's that's right, Bill. They, they, they couldn't crucify them. Hmm. Luke Luke twenty three fifty six. The 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 preparation day was completing and. Okay. <laughs> and then Luke 24, 1, it talks about the Sabbath. It's clearly laid out there. So this is all part of the midnight cry. The midnight cry lights the path all the way to the city. This is a very simple way. I mean, this, you've got to do all the other Bible study that's associated with that. But this is a very simple way. Once you're in the system, this is the fastest way to put it all together. Now, in the midnight cry, Samuel Snow says the Karaite, Jewish calendar being the correct calendar by which to determine the biblical festivals and thus determine the date October 22nd, 1844 as the date for, for the Day of Atonement that year. In the Midnight Cry, Samuel Snow says that the Vernal Equinox system is pagan and that this is the correct method that we should use. And yet virtually none of the feast-keeping groups use the Karaite system. Why? Well, because humans are rebellious. That's why. <laughs> if God says it, I'm going to do the opposite. That's, that's just... No, I'll do it my way. We're all Pharaohs. Hmm? We're all Pharaohs. <laughs> that's one way of putting it. Also part of the Midnight Cry, the giving of the law on Mount Sinai was a type of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. It's really, really important. Okay? The giving of the law, the outpouring of the Spirit. This is, this is all part of the midnight cry. Number nine, the coming of Christ is connected to the Jubilee and then the antitype of the Feast of Tabernacles will occur with the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, 
The Jubilee being connected, and Ellen White says this in earlier writings, page 35, that when Christ, when it was announced the day and the hour of the coming of Christ, then commenced the Jubilee, which is exactly what it says in the Midnight Cry. Why is that important? I guess we'll find out. You're saying something? No. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, you just, yeah. Adrian? Yes. How would you convince someone of the carry out calendar if they're not in Agnes, where Ellen White know all that means absolutely nothing to them? How, how would you convince them that the carry out calendar is the one you should follow? Well, um, you'd, you'd first go to the 70 week prophecy and you'd lay out the process and the, the, the prophetic aspects of Adventism and then you would show them that only the Karaite calendar can produce those dates. Yeah, and you're still re relying on Adventism. No, I'm but... Talking about people who... Um, the seven-week prophecy is not Adventism. The yeah. seven-week prophecy is Bible. Yeah. I mean, you can call it Adventism, but... Um, yeah. It's, it, it's just taking the Bible and... Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the Bible makes no reference to vernal equinox. Yeah, it. Adrian, the carry-up calendar is not doesn't originate in Adventism. No, it doesn't. No, no, no. You know, everything comes way before then, and it's just. And I mean, of course, then you go into the history of Hillel the second and how, you know, that he changed the calendar under threat of death from the Roman Emperor Constantine, who wasn't going to have his calendar by those Christ killers. And there's lots of history to present that aspect of... And look, at the and the other reason why Adventists followed the Karaite system is because the method of Bible interpretation or old Torah interpretation that the Karaites used is the same as the Millerites. And that is a literal rule of interpretation. Whereas all the others that follow the, the, the Mishnah and the, the, the other things are more spiritualized so you have to deal with all those things as, as well when you're looking at that. So, um, yeah, that's that's probably the way that I would approach it is is just to say, well, you know, the, the Karaites are following this this method of interpretation, and, and and of course, then you go down to the Bible, text by text, point by point. Uh, where is Vernal Equinox? And uh, I think I have I got it. Um, I don't think I've got it here, but I have an article in here down the side, which says, where does vernal equinox come from? Who were the first ones to observe the first new moon after vernal equinox? It was Babylon. Babylon had ver uh, followed the first new moon after vernal equinox, and then they would have, from that new moon, they would then have a seven-day rest period uh, after that new moon, which means that both the lunar Sabbatarian perspective and the vernal equinox system both come from Babylon. That's the earliest history that we have of those two systems, and those two ways of operating are very rampant in this movement. But it all comes from Babylon. So if, if you want to do vernal equinox and you want to do lunar Sabbatarian, you may as well keep Sunday. It all comes from the same place. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's all inter integrally linked. Now, some people would vigorously disagree with that. That's fine. <laughs> that's just, that's how I understand it. Um, were, there, uh, were there other um, systems, like there's a Karaite system, and there was a Babylonian calendar? Yep. So was there other ones? Uh, uh, other, other systems of calendation? Like, what other systems well, did you have to go through? There's m many other systems of calendation depending on different cultures and environments and how they they did things. So who would choose something different? I mean, what are the, you're only going to choose the Vernal Equinox, aren't they? Because that's the only thing that will exist. Um, who's going to choose? Like people who don't want to choose the Karaite calendar. Well, you could follow the Rabbinic Jews who have a different system again, or you could follow Rome who have a different system again. Uh, they have different calculation methods of how you do this. But the, the, the fact is that the word vernal equinox never appears in the Bible. So, you know, that's, 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 that's the big confrontation point. And I, I remember 
sitting. When I, when I first started keeping the feast, I followed the vernal equinox because that's what everyone else was doing. And I was just a new kid on the block and I just didn't know. I said, I've just come along for the ride. And until Di asked me to keep feasts in Australia, I thought, oh, now I've got to get a calendar sorted out. So, oh, thanks, Di. <laughs> <laughs> How can you tell when spring comes? Yeah. That's How do you know when new, the first new moon of spring? Uh, when the barley begins, the abib or aviv barley, when the barley begins to be ripe, yeah. the first new moon after this is the beginning of the year. Okay? Now, if you, if you look at ancient uh, or Paleo-Hebrew, the word for year has three letters, Shana. And the first letter is S, which in Paleo Hebrew is a seed. It's a seed. And then the second word is representing a set of teeth. And the third one is the hay, which is representing someone waving like this. So year means someone taking a seed, putting in their teeth, testing the moisture level, and they're going, it's ready. So it's built into the Hebrew. That the beginning of the year is... I still remember, I was reading it, I was in an airport in Colorado, and I'm reading this and going, that's it. This is it. It's right here in the Hebrew. It's right there in the word itself. It validates what the Karaites are saying. Shana, year. Take the seed, test it. Yep, it's ready. We, we, because the Passover is related to a harvest. And unless the barley is beginning to come ripe, you, they couldn't harvest it. Or wave the, wave the first fruits. How do you know? <laughs> you could count it before the flood. You could yeah. do all those things. And yeah, they'd already worked those systems out. So even if they had a gap of so many days. So, yeah, arguments in terms of how did they do this and when they were in the wilderness of temptation, was there, no, there was no barley in the desert. So how did they work all those things out? Thank you. They didn't keep any feasts in the wilderness because they'd apostatized and it should have only taken them a few months to get there, but they kind of blew that. So, I, um, so October 22nd, 1844 was taken from uh, the Day of Atonement, which was taken from the Carrier calendar, which means that if you are a true seven-day Adventist, which is what I was talking to this guy about, right? Yes. I said, so where are your roots? Just going back to that. Wow. And he said, in October 22nd, 1844, and I said, well, where did that come from? And we, we got to the point that it came from the Day of Atonement, right? But he still wouldn't accept that as that he had to sort of look at the feast question. <coughs> um, and that, well, that's another whole issue, isn't it? Numbers well, 23. Yeah. Numbers 23. Leviticus 23. Oh, sorry. I always get that. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Thank yeah, you. I mean, that's another whole issue because obviously Adventists believed in October 22nd, 1844 for over 150 years and never, well, except for a small group, they never committed to or understood because they never broke free of the, the dispensational covenant system. And that's what that's why we have documents like ceremonial dividing line how Adventists got jammed into a corner because they wouldn't eat pork uh, some of them began you know talking about clean and unclean and they say oh but that's old covenant and we shouldn't do that and then they couldn't use the word tithing because that was part of the Old Testament so they used the term sister Betsy uh, or systematic benevolence it's the tithe you have when you're not having a tithe because you can't tithe because that's old covenant it's just and the, how they came out of all that all that kind of understanding so so yes the, the midnight cry is uh, and of course the last one the period of a thousand years after the coming of Christ is a millennial Sabbath of rest this is all part of the midnight cry experience and um, that's that's my anchor point uh, for for this question so long answer to a short question all right Amplified answer. A, a, sorry? Amplified. Amplified, thank you. Any other questions on the calendar? 
So, you're going to go looking for a Tony? Yeah, well, so, does anyone else want one? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the true midnight cry. So we are going to be keeping Pentecost on June 12. Do you know why? Yes, the morrow after the Sabbath. Okay. So when we first thought we were going to sight the new moon on April 2, it meant that we would have started our Passover feast on the Sabbath. And then that means the morrow after the Sabbath during the feast would have been last Sunday and we would have started counting from last Sunday. But because it was a day later, our feast started on the Sunday which means that the you have the morrow after the Sabbath during the feast is actually at next Sunday. And that made it a week later, simply because the new moon was one day out. Okay? So that's why that's why we've gone to June twelve rather than June five for the seven the, the seven weeks of Pentecost, leading up to Pentecost, the day after. And again there's Lots of different perspectives on this. The rabbinic perspective is, uh, if you look in Leviticus 23, where it refers, they refer to the first day of unleavened bread as a Sabbath, which in principle it is, but in technicality it's not. It's what we call a Kodesh Mikra, which is holy convocation. But the rabbinic Jews say it's a Sabbath. So that means they would always begin the counting of the seven weeks after the 16th day of the first month. They would, they would always have Passover and then they would have their Sabbath and then they would start always counting on the 16th day. The seventh day Sabbath. Was the Karaites follow... The seventh day Sabbath, because the word Sabbath, there is no reference to Sabbath being the first day of unleavened bread. They're just following Miller's rules of interpretation. They're following a similar system. Obviously, they existed before Miller, but we're just saying the same principle existed. And there, there is some uh, material that circulates around that would seem to support the 16th day, and I've done presentations on that, uh, particularly if you look at uh, patriarchs and prophets uh, where it seems to support the 16th day theory and this is what's very interesting about the this the uh, midnight cry document is that he supports the karaite calendar but at the same time he mentions the 16th day so within this document there is still a misunderstanding of the karaite system uh, but the angel said that the midnight cry will light the path all the way to the city. So you have to resolve that contradiction in your own mind. And that's what we've had to do to work out, well, either the Karaite calendar is correct or the 16th day is correct. Not both of them can be correct. So we had to reconcile that, that process. And in reconciling that process, I lost a few more friends, as always happens with these things. <laughs> People, no, 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 wrong. So how did you reconcile that? How did I reconcile it? That's a good question, Ruben. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, if, if we were to um, if we were to keep the 16th day, we're not holding to a carrier principle. Mm. So, is it that we're understanding that um, our pioneers were still dispensational at the point that midnight cry was written? And therefore, feast keeping to them, hence Pentecost was completely irrelevant. Yeah, it was irrelevant it to had them. No context yeah, to 1844 had no context to the prophetic timeline. Hmm. So they weren't looking to keep the feast, so they weren't worried about those things. So, but if if you if you look at Leviticus 23, who prayed Jacob's home presentation? Remember, where he figured out that the Sabbath is different to the Sabbath Sabbath home. Yes. I, I remember that. So, 
Just, just some, for some. All right. Now notice this. This is important to understand. <coughs> Leviticus 23.15 And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Shabbat or Sabbath from the day that you brought the sheaf of... You're sorry. Right? sorry. That's alright. I'm used to that one. I just thought Gana's going to go here for a bit so we'll, we'll just let you go through. From the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths. So you're counting seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, this is the text you need to notice. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. Sabbath. So it's always going to be the morrow after the seventh Sabbath that is the 50th day. It's always going to be on so that would suggest it's always going to be on the first day of the week. It's not just seven Sabbaths. It has to coincide with 50 days. And you can't do that if you include the Mikra Kodesh as one of the Sabbaths. You won't arrive at 50 days. Okay, so that was, that was the next point I was going to make. So if we say that the 16th day is a Tuesday, and that's, you, that's a, a Sabbath as the rabbinics understand it, and you start your count on a Wednesday, and you count seven weeks from Wednesday, what, where do you end up? But it'd be it'll be Tuesday, because if you're counting from Wednesday to Tuesday, so the next day has to be a Sabbath, and it's not. So it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. And this and the wonderful thing about Pentecost is that it also completely derails the lunar Sabbath, because if you've got to count seven Sabbaths in a row, anyone who studied lunar Sabbatarianism knows that you get a gap day. Or two. Non -day. A non -day. You, get, you get a non-day occurring. And if you get two non-days occurring, you can't get 50 days. <laughs> and, they, and, and people just said to me, oh, you just, well, you just eliminate them. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> you just eliminate them. You're not, then, then you're not counting 50 days, you're counting 51 days or 52 days. And that creates tremendous problems. So I love, I love the, the count to Pentecost because it just sorts out quite a number of those sorts of issues. So that's why it's this text here that really convinced me. Well, it's got to be the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. There is no feast occurring anywhere that involves any kind of Sabbath outside of Passover except the seventh-day Sabbath. It's the only one that exists for that. Okay? Family, not, not cook, you know, yep. preserve tomatoes or something. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, like just do your um, cooking that's necessary. Yeah, necessary. Yes. And again, our, our emphasis on that is there's a, a great feast of the Holy Spirit occurring. Do I want to be engaging my mind in a whole lot of stuff to do with domesticated activities? Or do I want my mind completely free to... You know, it's, it's, it's a personal choice. Like, if you, if you still want to do food prep and all those things, and it's fine. It's, that's, that's fine. But you want your mind to be as free as possible so you, you can be thinking about spiritual things so that it's the, it's, the, it's the desire for the spirit that is the motivator, not the, okay, what can I do, what can't I do? Just that. It's just, we just put that emphasis on it in terms of what, what we're doing. And as, as some people discovered when they came to this camp and... They, the first time they'd kept a feast with us, and uh, some of you will remember this story, and it was the first time they kept the feast, and someone said, tomorrow's a Sabbath. Yes. They're like, well, why didn't anybody tell me? I've got these small kids, and now I can't even wash the nappies and everything like that. I, oh, chill, chill, chill. We'll help you do the washing. Don't worry about it. It's okay. It's, it's fine. Just, you've got to learn to crawl before you can walk and all those kinds of things, so don't, don't get bent out of shape over it like... Apart from the fact we don't worship a God that condemns. so, And we're drawn into this because of our desire for the Spirit and our desire to be refreshed by these things. But in some groups, it can be very much like, you're doing it wrong. It's the wrong day. You've got it wrong. What, what are you doing? It's like, this is what I do. So, uh, I've got another question that I've had for six years. Um, six years. 
<laughs> well, we're in the seventh year, sister, so now it gets answered. So, <laughs> um, so are we supposed to um, uh, eat unleavened bread that way? Is there any reason why we should do that now? Um, just give up yeast, yeast products for that week? That's what it says, doesn't it? Yes. Um, my, my response t to that is um, it's not going to hurt you to, to do that. But my, my, my frontline response to that is ask your Father in heaven. You know, the, we don't want to make rules and regulations. You've got the Bible there. Go to your father, ask him what to do. I, I could pontificate on what I think needs to happen, but I'm not going to. Would that make you a moron? Yeah. It would make me a moron. I'm not going to do that. So, what, one of the things that really concerned me about Entering into feast keeping was the mindset of rules and regulations and salvation through the law and this sort of approach, uh, which is quite, it can be quite at war with the free grace of Christianity and the freedom in Christ and all those things. And I, I really wanted to emphasize the gift. And this is what we emphasize in our message, the gift of the Holy Spirit that's available at these times because we don't want to create any impression that you must do these things in order to be saved. Because if you are focused on anything to be saved outside of the gift of the Holy Spirit, you are outside of the gospel. And so when I saw that the gift of the Holy Spirit is what's coming through the festivals, I'm like, I'm in. This is great. It's the gift of the Holy Spirit that's freely available. So when it comes to any of these other things, I say to people, ask your father. If, you know, like, it's a great thing to do. Why not? It's good. But I don't put any prescriptions on anything about what anybody needs to do other than say, well, read it, talk to your father, ask him what you need to do. So there's my answer. comes <laughs> must you're musty. We don't want the musty smell. But if your father is telling, yeah, this is a good thing to do. This is what you... But for a lot of people, it's like, yeah, but what am I supposed to do? <laughs> Believe on him whom God has sent. John 6, 29. He'll guide you. He'll lead you. And I kind of like to have a bit of that freedom when it comes to those things where not everybody is lockstep marching to one drum in terms of how things are going to be played out and how we do things. And I mean, for myself, traveling to many different countries and preaching the gospel and participating in communion, and they all have different ways of doing it. If you have one way of doing it, you're going to make a lot of enemies really fast. You just, you just, <laughs> you just adapt. And, and that's why, you know, we went in the early days, we went through the process of what's the correct mode of baptism? Shall we do the Nazi salute over people and baptize them under the water? Who says that's in the Bible? You know, like we it said, it, it doesn't say. It doesn't say who and, 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 you know, we did the, you know, where Paul says, I bow my knee before the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why not, why not stand behind someone as they kneel before their Father and they kneel down in the water? Why not do that? Just trying to break up people's mindsets of traditions that actually are not in the Bible. It doesn't matter. Baptizo means getting them all under the water. That's all it means. However you get under the water, it doesn't. there's no sanctified way of doing this other than to get them under the water. We might go face forward to stop the nut water going up their nose. That's it. That's it. We get, we, and, and, you know, and people say, well, you know, shall we baptize in the name of Jesus or in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? Whatever you want. Both are in the Bible. I'm, I'm completely relaxed about those things. So, because yeah, people are always looking for formulas and this is, we're doing it the right way and I've ticked all the boxes and I've made God happy. It's just, it's just... The work of God is to believe on Him. Believe on Him whom God has sent. That's, that's the work, to believe on Him. If you think being baptised in a particular manner is going to 
And, and look, when it comes to the idea of perfection, the only perfect baptism that's ever occurred on this earth is the baptism of Jesus. That's the perfect baptism to God, and it, we're baptised into him. So everything else is, yeah, but it's good that we, when we do this. That was a big issue. We just recently went to a baptism, and the person that got baptised was baptised into the church and into the priests. <laughs> and it was really quite, it was actually quite, it was sad really, because she didn't really know what she was getting baptised in. And what you just said there, we get baptised into the life of Christ. We baptise into his character, into his name. Yeah. And that was one thing that, as I thought about it later on, how that the church many of us came from, being baptised into Christ was synonymous with being baptised into the church. Mm. And that's really, really bad. Really bad. Because, you know, you, and I, I remember when I baptised people, like, why do I have to be baptised into this organisation? Why can't I just be baptized into Christ? Is it biblical and, to be baptized into a Well, where does the Bible say this? It doesn't say this. It says the Lord added to the church daily those that are being saved. He added them. And why were they added to the church? Because they saw that they were having such a good time that they wanted to be with them. Not because they'd signed their name off and now you're part and here. Remember the tithes and the offerings. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> You know, it, it's and and look. As a young minister, I did these things in good faith until I started thinking about the implications of these things. And you know, the the whole process of when you've done six months of Bible studies and you've done all of these things and you've cleaned up your act and you've done all of that kind of stuff, then you're good enough for us to baptize you. That that sends all kinds of bad messages. Now. On the other token, it is, it is good when you're baptised into Christ to be in a stable situation because if you're not in a stable situation and you're baptised into Christ, we all know what happened. What happened to Jesus when he was baptised? What happened next? He got hammered for 40 days. So when you get baptised into Christ, Satan's not going to go, oh, isn't that nice? We'll just leave them alone now. No, he's going to come in harder and attack you and if someone is not stable in their relationships and in whatever they're doing, it's probably, yeah, you want to wait for them to be at least stable before they can be, before they'll take that step in baptism. So that's kind of the way that I've approached that without any kind of preconditions other than believing in the name of Christ. So that baptism of repentance that John did was different to the baptism by the, by the apostles when, on, did they baptise on the day of Pentecost? Did they baptise people at that point? Or did uh, they just say they were added to the church? They were Jews that were added and they were, they were already they already understood the doctrines and well, well many of them yes but then of course we have the Ethiopian who was baptised and I mean he was a student of the Old Testament we, knew, we know that so so yes um, John just baptised anybody who came along. He wasn't going to give them a quiz, was he? So he didn't say to the Pharisees, bring forth fruits of repentance. The one thing that I've looked for in ministry is to see whether people are in love with Jesus. If they love him and they want to follow him, that's what you're looking for. Evidence is that they love him. Not, not that, yep, 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 what do I have to do? What do I have to do, right? Yep, yep, let's get in. And It's like, do you love Jesus? Do you, do you, do you, and is it, is it starting to affect your life? Are you starting, when you fall in love with Jesus, your life's going to change. It's not because of a whip that's been cracked or anything like that. You're just, you're just in love with him. So you start changing. And then when you see evidence of that, well, then the spirit is, the evidence of the spirit in their life is showing you that they're ready to be baptized. You don't need any other evidence. The spirit in them is giving evidence of this. So, yeah. Did I see a hand right down the back? No? <laughs> I was going to say, Adrian, with, with John the Baptist, I mean, he, how long did he preach for? How long was he get? We don't know, do we? Do we know how long? Um, it wasn't too long. People, people 
people knew what he was preaching and that knew that he was there. So they would have gone to him because they wanted repentance. And they yeah, baptism of repentance. For that. And yes. so, um, yeah. It wasn't a, um, a thoughtless thing for, for people to go and... No, no, no. They wanted to repent of, of, of their sins in that regard. And so, you know, with, with some of these things, we, we are seeking to move into a freedom in the gospel without a spirit of recklessness and disregard. And, and this is why the other night, you know, we were, many of us were taught that in the communion service that when the bread that's left over is supposed to be buried or burnt. Well, where's that in the Bible? It actually says, leave none of it till the morning. Leave none of it till the morning. And Jesus said concerning the wine, drink ye all of it. That's what the Bible says. And so, you know, we're sort of busting myths. Not, not you know, people says, well, this is the way we were taught, so we're going to do it different. There's a spirit of rebellion in wanting to do it different from the way you did in the past, as opposed to, well, what does the Bible actually say? And where is the freedom in these things? And this is what we're, we're trying to do in, in what we're learning. So, all right, Glennis. Matthew 10, 28, can you explain? Oh, Matthew 10, 28, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> now I can go into my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> the Glennis and I didn't discuss this before. Matthew ten twenty eight. Okay. Shall I shall I magnify that? Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Who's the one that you're to fear? Who is the destroyer? So, what are you suggesting, Lester? I'm suggesting that where destruction in hell is involved, then it can't be God. Okay. The hearers that are listening to what Jesus is saying. When they hear these words, what do they think he's referring to? God. Okay? So his hearers would be thinking, ah, he's talking about God here. Okay? But what's the very next verse? So we're supposed to, we're supposed to fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And then he says this, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father knowing that's what he's meaning but the very hairs of your head are all numbered fear ye not therefore you're of more value than many sparrows so how do you put these two verses together fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul and hell but don't be afraid because you're of more value than many sparrows does that suggest if we're talking about the same person does that suggest a possible contradiction? How can you, if, if God is the one that's going to destroy your body and soul in hell, how can you not be afraid? How can you not be afraid? It doesn't matter if he knows how many hairs you've got, he's still going to destroy you. He's still going to destroy you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ruben. Danielle's got a hand up. Yeah, I was just thinking about the word fear. <coughs> fear, fear, or is that reverence, reverence and awe? You know, like just like how we see the word anger or or um, yeah. wrath yeah. is being yeah. grief or sorrow. So, you know, so is phobia, which means to be exceedingly afraid. To be exceedingly afraid. Okay, so we're engaging now in the process of reconciliation. How do we reconcile two things that seem to be completely opposite? That's what that's what my uh, that's what my presentation was about tonight. But we don't have to do that. We can, do, we can shortcut that. We're having more fun doing this. So, this is where you need to understand the gospel. And what is the gospel process? The gospel process is found for us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20. What does... Oh, 45. 
Romans. I did a Fiona. Romans. <laughs> Romans 45 is not available. I don't think it's available in any translation. So, what is the gospel process? Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So what does Jesus have to do first for the hearers that, for the people that are listening to him, they have this view of God that God destroys and kills people. And so the law enters. A law is a representation of Christ. Christ enters with his words and he speaks that. You're right. He speaks that which, which magnifies their understanding. Sorry, Daniel's been eating toothpaste. Oh. <laughs> Be very afraid, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even know the numbers of the hair on your head. So, so he has to bring out of them their own understanding. Be afraid of him that can destroy both body and soul and hell. Jesus is speaking the words that they think. He brings it to the surface. For what purpose? That where sin abounded, grace might much more abound. And then he tells them, do not be afraid. You're of more value than many sparrows. Can you make the connection? The confirmation of that is in verse 25 of, of Matthew 10. Matthew 25. Matthew 10, 25. Matthew 10, 25. That Romans 5, 20 there reminds me of like the yeast and the leaven that it's a little bit, but then it grows up to this really big thing to make it swell up. So the sin has to abound. The sin has to abound in order to see their wrong understanding, their wrong comprehension. So I would have thought that, you know, like... I'm just going to read this, Tony. Yeah, sorry, yeah. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub. Which means they're referring to God as Satan. And so that's the way he's putting it in 1028. Okay. He's projecting upon God the attributes of Beelzebub, which is the devil, the destroyer of body and soul. And then he clarifies the understanding in the following verse by saying, that's actually not what my God is. That's, that's not what my father is like. So he's meeting them where they're at. Hmm? That's, that's lovely. Is it, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and just for confirmation for you, this is, this is the, remember the two pillars of 263, Education 263, Christ Object Lessons, Object Lessons 263. We go to Christ Object Lessons, page 263, and this is what we're talking about, this principle here. Talking about the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Why did Jesus tell the parable of the rich man and Lazarus? That caused many, many people to believe that God burns sinners in hell forever. And everybody, everybody when they go to heaven, you're going to be issued with a very dark pair of sunglasses and a big set of earmuffs. Why? So you don't see and hear the spirit screaming of the dam, <laughs> damned over the other side. Won't that be a wonderful place to be? You can walk around with these earmuffs. You don't have to listen. They'll be, you know, anyway. So, what is Jesus doing by telling this parable? In this parable, Christ, sorry. In this parable, Christ was meeting the people on their own ground. So, what is Jesus doing in saying, be afraid of him that can destroy the soul and body in hell? Can God destroy, could he destroy the body and soul in hell? Could he do it? But, but could he do it? Of course he could do it. But would he do it? Never. God could have destroyed Satan as a pebble. As easily as a man can. He could do it. And so Christ, he doesn't say, be afraid because my father's got you marked and he's going to kill you. He didn't say that. He said, yeah, it's possible. And I'm meeting you on your own ground. So he meets them on their own ground. The doctrine of a conscious state of existence between death and the resurrection was held by many of those who were listening to Christ's words. So when he's saying, able to destroy body and soul in hell, his hearers all believe this. And so he's meeting them on their own ground. 
The Saviour knew their ideas and he framed his parable so as to inculcate important truths through these preconceived opinions. That's a very nice way of saying through their errors. Why is Jesus speaking truth through error? So he can show how grace much more abounds. So he can show how grace does much more abound. Exactly. That's the point. He's meeting them where they are at. The law enters that sin might abound. And this is what we see in this text. And here is the mirror. He held up before his hearers a mirror. This is the mirror. Wherein they might see themselves in their true relation to God. So what is Jesus doing in Matthew 10, 28? He's holding up a mirror. And through this mirror, he then inculcates important truths for them. You're of more value than many sparrows. That's the truth he's trying to convey. But he conveys it through a error that man believes because he can only start where man is if he wants to bring man to a better understanding he has to start where man is and man always starts in error and that's why jesus can be accused of teaching things that are strange and that's where we get caught out in this particular verse but as soon as you find a contradiction be afraid of him that can destroy body and soul in hell and don't be afraid you're of more value than many sparrows it's a contradiction as soon as you see a contradiction, you know that the mirror is working. And you have to resolve that contradiction and to see where the mirror is occurring. And you overlay that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And that's a very common, well-recognized teaching principle to take people from what they know or understand to what they don't yet understand. Yes, to take them from what they know and then illuminate them and to help them to understand, oh, okay, I had a wrong understanding. Without actually saying you were wrong. Without actually saying you were wrong. No, that's wrong. So would you like a, a tip on how to speak to people? That's wrong. No, that's not what Jesus did. How many people do you win to your understanding by telling them they're wrong? Okay. You're worshipping an idol. <laughs> Listen to me. You're worshipping the devil. Listen to me. It doesn't work. You can't do that. It just won't. Won't reach out, Reuben. I was just going to say, we've gone from worshiping power to worshiping oh. character, right? Oh. And that's what Matthew ten twenty eight is doing. Power. He's saying he could kill. He could he kill power, power but shows his character. character. Thank you. Oh. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh. Any other questions? Oh. oh, that's right. Sorry, Tony. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I always thought that when it says that we're sin abounds, I always thought that was when God's actually showing you that you, that you are a sinner, right? Mm. And um, like it's, it's, it's very personal. Yes. Like it, <laughs> like it, it, it actually makes you, <laughs> you actually see that you are. No one else is talking to you about this. You actually like see it, you know, for what, for what it is. And uh, at that time, it's... Um, it's a bit of a life-changing experience because you actually start seeing yourself as this person who is not very nice. Yeah. And then, through that, there's forgiveness. And that's where um, grace does much more abound because he's, he's actually forgiven you, he's given you mercy. Yeah. But that's that's so, the amazing thing about the gospel. And I just see that, that connection like that simple. So, so see this connection. You said you're convicted privately. What does it say the word entered means? The word entered means to come in alongside, that is, supervene additionally or stealthily. Come in privately. Moreover, the law enters into your mind. It's a very private thing. And convicts you of sinfulness. And so Jesus surfaces their understanding of God as a killer. He brings it up. He causes that sin to abound. And then he tells them the truth about his father. And once you understand this principle, the Bible starts to change. But of course, if the beautiful thing about the Bible is if you really don't want to serve God, you really don't want to follow God, you can twist what Jesus is saying or the Bible is saying and make it sound like God is a killer if you want to do that. For instance, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Did the disciples struggle with that statement? Yes. 
And they're starting to think, he wants us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Ugh! And that's where you get the 666 moment. John 666. You know what that is? They all left. That's what 666 means. They all left Christ. Pastor Adrian, that Romans 520. I got it, I got it. Yes. The Romans 520 also for me is a great hope for those in your family or who you love greatly that you know sin is abounding in their life. Yeah. That you can go, sin is abounding, but I know grace abounds much more. It's something to hang on to. Yes, Fiona, I'm on your page with that one. I was just going to say that that verse to me is a statement to outside of yourself. Definitely what Tony said, I agree with. But when you see someone in a position that is complete ignorance and error, you can just say, oh, God, grace is going to abound so much more here because they are in that state. Yeah, exactly. And that where, that's where the no judgment comes in. It, 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 that fits in that capture too. That yep. No. Judging is just more grace, more grace, more grace. Amen. Amen. John 6.66, from that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Is that an accident? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's cool. That's really, really cool. It's the, the John 6.66 moment, like, eat your flesh and drink your... You're a loser. You've lost it. We're, we're out of here. And these things are going to come up. And it's important that we understand these principles because... Things are going to come up in the future and if you're still thinking in the flesh and then a, a, a truth comes from God that you need to understand in the spirit and you're still walking in the flesh, you're going to have a 666 moment and slap, you get the mark of the beast. It can happen just like that. So, go listen. Listen to what the spirit is saying. To whom shall we go? Yeah, where shall we go, Lord? Will you also leave me? That's what he said. To whom shall we go? So when you don't understand something, it seems like it's all gone sideways. You have to realise you haven't studied it properly. And you have to spend some time thinking about it. That's it. And that, that reveals whether you have humility or not. Yes. If when you, you don't know something, because if you always have to have an answer, and then you suddenly, there's a con and you can't explain it, mm. you get revealed at that moment. Like, uh, could you explain that to me? Or, well, um, you get this shooting from the hip, as we often hear from people when you present them a text and they're like, and they just shoot from the hip. They don't even think about it because you can't be right. Yeah, they, have to hold the they have to hold the position. If, if Follow the creed. If someone points out to you that you've done something wrong and you deny it, like God's pointing out to your sin and you deny it, then you've actually overlooked any mercy and then that's when you're in trouble like that, you'll, you'll, you'll use any excuse to walk away from Christ. I didn't do it. And this, the reason why we would not want to repent is because our view of God is that if we acknowledge that we've done the wrong thing, like Cyril was talking about this afternoon about electrical <coughs> things that have been done, if they admit they've done the wrong thing, what happens? Liability. Liability. Punishment. punishment. And that's exactly what Adam's struggling with. Yeah, punishment. Fear of punishment. So if I admit that I've done the wrong thing, I have fear of punishment, I don't want to be punishment, I don't admit it. But when you know the character of God, you know that He's ever merciful, you know that He's always going to... It's easier to repent. Yeah. And so Christianity makes it very hard to repent. Yeah. Because they're saying, repent or God's going to blow your head off. So that makes it hard to repent. Like, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. I haven't done anything. Because if I admit it, then you're going to kill me. So, yeah. And it's all right for new people to confess their sins and come into the church and do all those things. And you've done it once and then you're in the church and then you just don't admit anything. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? I think we're done. Sorry? One, two, sing. One, two, sing. Yeah. I, I just want to say that this is, this has been one of the most, talking about John, um, Matthew 10, 28, this has been one of the most powerful things for me in realising that I've been reading the scriptures incorrectly. I, I just, yeah, how do you answer these questions? Like, 
I've had plenty of people say to me, well, be afraid of him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. And, and just, you know, simple things. I just want to mention this. I love this. Deuteronomy 32.39. Deuteronomy 30. Ooh, got it. Deuteronomy 32.39. Let's take all the numbers out so you can, you can follow. Oh, we'll, put, we'll do it in that one. That's all right. People love to quote this to me. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill. See, Adrian? I kill. And you say God doesn't kill, and the Bible says God kills. And I say, keep reading. <clears throat> and I make alive. And, and I say, does that say, or I make alive? Or does it say, and I make alive? So people read part of... Satan says, throw yourself down from the temple and the Lord will bear you up. Did Satan quote all of the scripture? No, he only quoted part of the scripture. And so if you simply read the whole text, I kill and I make alive, semicolon, meaning that what comes next is exactly the same as what's just been said. I wound and I heal. So the one that is being killed is the one that is being made alive. And how are we killed? Well, we are crucified with Christ. Self is laid in the dust and then we are made alive. The letter kills and the spirit giveth life. It's just when you have the right glasses on, you can actually read the Bible. But we should understand this from being children. When your parent issues you an instruction, why is it that many times the children misunderstand what the parent is saying? Why do they do that? Is it because the parent can't speak English properly? Because they don't want to do it. They don't listen. Listen. Listen to what I'm saying. So often that People listen with the intent to overthrow. And this is why our whole government system is in a desperate process that's all going down the tubes because the government leaders don't listen to each other, do they? They bark at each other. And no one's actually listening. Everyone's just trying to score points and they're not actually listening. So if you actually listen to what God is saying... I kill and I make alive is a beautiful statement of the gospel. It's a gospel statement. Isn't that just one word? Didn't you say that's just one word? What? One word? Yeah, that phrase, isn't it just one word or something like that? So, I kill, make alive. I kill, there's, there's the Hebrew word, there's the Hebrew word, there's the Hebrew word. And I make alive is one word. With yeah, with all the prefixes and suffixes that go with it. I kill, make alive. I kill, make alive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so do we need to put on our red glasses at night to get rid of the blue EMS so we read it? That's right. There you go. Got rid of the blue light. Oh, mine just went off too. No, the change of the glasses. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I thought you were talking about the no, 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 EMS. No, 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 no. When you said you need to put new glasses on. So do we need to put our yes. red glasses on? Yes, rose-coloured. So get rid of the, the blue that is telling us that incorrectly. Yes, you have to be able to read correctly. Eye self, have eye self to see so that we can understand. Why is it that so many people don't want to believe in a God that is completely loving, merciful and gracious? Because we're not completely loving, gracious and merciful. Because they want to see their enemies destroyed. Yes, and were we not in this position at some stage? And we believe that God is like us. Yeah, we we want a God like us. We want a God like us. I want a God that's going to sort out people that annoy me. So it's kind of convenient to have a belief in a God that's going to burn and destroy people. So, all right, Lorraine has got a hand up. Hebrew word there is, as we would say it in that English vernacular, moose. Really? Moose. Moose. 
What's the Hebrew word? What's what? Bara. B-A-R-A. Oh, create. Yeah, create. Mm. Bara. Is that in that? Uh, there or? Make alive. Yeah. No, it's a different word. To live. Okay. Different Hebrew word. Okay. But I think I know what you're trying to yeah. say. <laughs> I thought it had two meanings. Um, yeah, I think you're referring to um, I create good and make evil. Is that Isaiah 45, verse 7? Yeah. Is that what you're referring to? Do you want to look at that? Is it 45 7? Yes. I form the light and create darkness. Create is bara. I create darkness. I make peace and create evil. What? Mm -hmm. What what's that's the same word? So how do we understand that? Does God create evil and make darkness? Yeah, that's one understanding because the word to create means to cut down in the sense of cutting something down in order to create something. So, but if I looked, I think if I looked at the tense and mood of that, it didn't actually have that element in it. So it's actually something else that's being described there. So, I make peace and I create evil. Is that what people, a lot of people believe? Yeah. Yeah. So we're starting with that. So how do we reconcile this? God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So then you, then you go through the reconciliation process as to drop down ye heavens from above, let the skies pour down righteousness, let the earth. So you put these two together, you starting where man is understanding and then being brought through into what is actually being expressed. But you can only do that when you sense that there's a contradiction. And if it says that he makes darkness, but in him is no darkness at all then you've got a contradiction and you have to resolve that contradiction. And that's what leads you to the mirror and that's what, yeah. Psalms, yeah. And in Psalms 97. So you're saying every time we see a contradiction, we need to consider the mirror there where God's speaking and letting us see what we think like and then what the reality is. Because hmm. is if there's a contradiction, how do you resolve it? And what most people do is that they just choose one side of the contradiction that suits their understanding. They don't try and reconcile the contradiction to harmonize in their own mind. And the Bible is written in such a perfect way to reveal what is in our hearts. But this is saying that we believe that God creates darkness and evil. Yes. But in reality, he is creating light and peace. Yes, light and peace. And we understand that. Uh, um, if, his, if his darkness is swelling, what is the swelling? Something is wrapped in. It's wrapped around him. I have a presentation called "Light Through Darkness," which which addresses that. We won't go into all of that tonight. But yes, it's a. Well, humility, yes. There's that aspect of it, and but it's also a wrapping around. It. A covering that's being that's being mentioned there. He was surrounded by darkness. Yes. Yeah, surrounded by darkness, completely exposed. But you know, it was in darkness that his yep. father surrounded him. Yep. But he was at his most. Yeah. But I would suggest to you, and this is another whole subject, that darkness was coming from humanity, not from God, because mm -hmm. that's their understanding of God and so it manifests itself in the creation because man has dominion over the earth. There evil angels around the well that that's that all the evil angels are there as well. <coughs> so God speaks light into the darkness. But the darkness is there because anyway. 
A lot more about that in here. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's 8.40. Some of you are getting restless. Let's, uh, do you want, do you want to have a sing, do you? Paul said one, two, sing. Don't worry about what Paul said. <laughs> <laughs> I can get the strap. Four eighty six, I do believe. All right. It's the will of the people. Four eight six. I do believe. How does that go, Debbie? You're gonna come up and sing? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. As soon as I hear the tune I might Narelle knows it, that's a yeah, good start. If I haven't heard a tune for a while, I need to hear the tune. And then. Ah! I know that tune. Tune, isn't it? And how does he set us free by his precious blood? By letting us shed us shed his blood and realizing that we did this and that he forgives us. Alright, let's let's pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the opportunity to study in your word. We thank you as we recount the things that you've been teaching us, that we can have great gratitude and thanks to you, that the Bible does speak with a clear voice and presents a beautiful picture of your character. And if we are patient and ask you to guide us, you will lead us into all truth. I pray for everyone gathered here that they will sense your spirit near and to know that you are such a tender father and that you care for us so wonderfully and you sent your son to show us what you are really like. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Eight o'clock for prayers tomorrow. Eight o'clock. Come for prayer. Have a good evening, everyone.
teacher.